Hello, everyone. Today is Thursday, August 20th, 2015, and this is the week in charts. I'm actually out of due once again. I've got to remember. It's been, I've been so busy lately. Little things like this have uh, slipped my mind. Anyway, uh, disclaimer screen, obligatory, or as I like to say, all predictions are about the future. And a lot of stuff can happen between now and then. I was getting ready for the chart show this morning, and I was thinking, what can I talk about? Because I didn't have a, a whole lot of great examples to teach off of this week. And then um, somebody emailed me wondering about gold and silver, and I said, you know what? I had an epiphany. Why not talk about charts during a chart show? And then there's a lot of things from last week's show I want to recap on. I think they're vitally important, especially given today's weakness. Um, one thing... I thought about it too. It's always darkest right before, and I think you know the rest of that, or maybe you don't. We'll talk about that in just one second. We talked about the death cross, so-called death cross, is where your 50 crosses over the 200-day moving average. I ignore all news. It's so funny. It's like um, I ignore all news. And then they get an email. Hey, Dave, what do you think about the media talking about the death cross? Like, well, I ignore all news. I didn't realize they were talking about it, but um, I'm not that worried about it. And uh, there will come a time where we might need to worry about these things, and that will make sense. Uh, rusty bow ties, still rusty bow ties. And once again, Tom Petty, Redux market. That will all make sense in a second, um, even if this is your first show. Okay, uh, media gets all excited about the so-called death cross. And it's probably just because of the name. And obviously I had a little fun with my fonts in here. Um, but a death cross is just when the 50-day moving average – crosses below the 200-day moving average. And you could see that it's getting a little ominous in here, at least based on this signal. We are beginning to squeeze in. Now, sometimes markets, as you can see, like right here and right here, sometimes you just get a little squeeze down to the moving average and it takes off again. And that's actually, that, that could actually be, if it's not a trading system in and of itself, it could be a trading system in and of itself. And as I've also said, if you just kind of pay attention to the daylight, meaning that the lows are greater than the moving average, a trade on that side of the market for the most part, and the caveat is when the market is trending, you will stay on the right side of the trend. But, yes, as far as the signal is concerned, notice that your 50-day moving average here, I have it blown up for you, is converging on your 200-day moving average. And, by the way, with moving averages, you have what's called a drop-off effect. And you take today's – well, I guess it would be tomorrow, but let's just say yesterday's close is dropped off. I'm sorry, yesterday's close is added in. Let's just start from scratch. Okay, at the close of today, we're going to add in today's close. And the moving average is also live at the time I, I captured this. So let's just, for all intents and purposes, say we close here. So this is what the moving average is. is. So you're adding in that price, and you go back 200 days, okay, wherever that is, and you drop off this price, whatever that is. So – you get the idea. You're dropping off these prices way down here, and you're adding in prices way up here. So that will cause the moving average to begin to catch up with price. That's called the drop-off effect for those of you who are new to moving averages. Um, not the end of the world when you have a death cross. In fact, last week, as I pointed out, we had a couple of them since 2009, and we've had a pretty good run so far since 2009. We had one in 2010, and we had one in 2011. Now, the market won't always survive a death cross, but don't get too caught up in any one signal or the hype of anything like this. Yes, you have to pay attention. Yes, I remember those death crosses more specifically because I think I had some uh, shorter term bow ties triggering. I got stopped out of some longs. We had some shorts triggered in. You have to continue playing the game, okay? And if you get stopped out, you get stopped out. I'm working on a piece today, which is due today for Proactive Traders Magazine, and I'm going to talk a little bit about some of these indicators, I think. And the, the thing is, these indicators are all great, but they do have quite a bit of lag to them. So if you sit around and wait for a death cross to sell your stocks, go back in history and look at what happens when that happens. It, there's, been, there's been some great signals throughout history especially over the last 30 years or so. But every now and then, that market will sell off really hard. So you have to sell first 
and ask questions later. Now, by sell first, I don't mean that you get out at any signs of adversity because if you do that, you will never, ever catch a trend. What you do, though, is you have a stop in place at an area that is outside of the shorter term normal volatility of the market, and if it gets hit, it gets hit. Richard says, is their webinar being recorded? Absolutely. And I will put it up to, I've been getting a lot of requests. So I used to sell these, but uh, I now put them up on YouTube. So it'll be up on YouTube uh, pretty soon. So again, we had a couple of signals since 2009 and they didn't materialize. So always price first and foremost. And like in a case like this, I do remember, seem to remember fairly vividly that we did get stopped out of some longs. And that was a pretty serious slide. Now this could have obviously kept on going, uh, but it didn't. It kind of faked everybody out back here and then it began to go back up again now i was asked and we'll come back to the uh, russell 2000 in just a few seconds here a few minutes i should say but i was asked about gold and silver this morning and as i was making my way to gold and silver i thought it'd be kind of interesting to take a look at the energies because the energies kind of caught my eyes uh caught my eye on the way over there now this um chart is a wonderful example of quite a few things and one thing that kind of jumped out at me is notice you have in classical technical analysis terms you have a triple top up here okay and that's pretty cool and as I've preached quite often you don't necessarily want to rush out and try to trade off of classical technical analysis but learn it and understand it and embrace it and read Read the old books by Schaubacher and people like that, and then read some of the more modern classics by people like Murphy and Pring. But don't rush out, and also uh, older classics, again, would be like um, some of Gann, not uh, Gann's more, the, the psychology of Gann, like the, uh, what is it, How to Make Profits in Commodities, maybe the first 50 pages or so of that, where he talks about the philosophy of markets and, and avoid all that crazy Gann stuff. Uh, uh, else otherwise, but that book is worth getting just for the first 50 pages. And the other one, obviously, is Edwards and McGee. Anyway, um, so learn about, the point is, learn about that classical technical analysis, but don't rush out and try to use it. But use it as a framework when you have some sort of signal. So, for instance, you have a bit of a double tie beginning to work here, and then you have a bow tie. Well, notice that the bow tie didn't really trigger or didn't really materialize. Then now you have a triple top, okay? So don't rush out and try to sell a triple top, but notice that you have another bow tie here. Now, when you have a bow tie off of multi-year highs, that is a, that's a good signal, okay? That's what I call a major signal if it's off of multi-year highs. And, of course, books by Dave Landry. Well, thank you, Michael. I appreciate that. Michael is not a show. I promise you that. Um, so that's a major bow tie. Now, a minor one would be if you're coming off of, uh, like this one here, it's just coming off of a multi-month lows. Not that you should completely ignore the signal, but it's not what I would consider a major signal. I know a lot of people out there, and I see a lot of bloggers out there uh, talking about bow ties when, when you have, like, a high-level signal like this this is not the designer's intent okay that's not what i had in mind with the bow tie what i had in mind with the bow ties was major tops and major bottoms these can work okay nonetheless but i'm more excited about a major bow tie off of major major highs or off of major major lows now what it, what's pretty cool here is sometimes these second mouse signals could work really nicely especially and I'm going to flesh this out in just one second. Maybe I should have had that other slide first. But when you have a brand new high like this, and then you have a bow tie, okay, this high is what I would call, once the market begins to break down, I would call that a confirmed, confirmed top. And it's going to make more sense in just one second until proven otherwise. But in this particular case, notice that the bow tie really did materialize. And it didn't take out this uh, low of the move, okay? So you get the thrust down here. You got the bow tie, and then if this first thrust lower, not to be confused with the first thrust setup, so but if this first, let's just call it leg lower, is taken out, then it confirms this bow tie, and then it confirms this top. 
Well, in this particular case, it went up, but notice just barely scratched the surface of that prior top. So you have to continue to wonder if the top is in place until, of course, or unless, of course, it breaks out decisively. But here we have a backup or a second bow tie in a row. Now, when you have these second signals, I call that, or it's been dubbed the second mouse signal. And, and the, the theory there is the early bird gets the worm, but the second mouse gets the cheese, okay? And sometimes those signals can be very powerful, especially after something like a triple top in here. So, again, the classical technical analysis gives you a wonderful framework to work around, okay? Also, the, the bow ties, especially like the long – well, the bow ties and the longer term moving averages give you kind of a, a, a better um, indication of where the trend – may be emerging or established, okay? Now, you got to be careful because there's lag at all these things. Always look at price first as I preach. But the combination of two could be very powerful. So we could see that's the top that we had at Energies a while back. Now, notice that it began to implode pretty seriously before you actually had the death cross, which was right. So you, had, you went all the way to here right before you had the so-called death cross, where the 50-day simple moving average – crosses below the 200-day moving average. By the way, notice the lag in moving averages because this moving average is still headed higher, as you can see, because of the drop-off effect, and then price just kind of sliced through it like butter. There's nothing magical about a moving average. There's nothing magical about a support and resistance or anything. There was a um, – I don't know the exact names. I'm trying to think who told the story. I think it's Douglas told the story. It's like there was a um, like a young punk kind of technical analysis kind of guy – and there was a floor trade, and the floor traders just kind of followed the tape all day. And the floor trader wanted to get, uh, was uh, looking to get off the floor. And then the young punk technical analysis type of guy was teaching him all about technical analysis and the merits of technical analysis, blah, blah, blah. And he says, well, here you have support. The market won't go below the support. He goes, really? He says, yeah, you know, it's this is the support, and he, blah, 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 and explain how it worked. And then um, the guy reaches over, picks up his phone, and says, um, "You know, what would it take to what would it take to break this market?" And they're like, uh, "I don't know, five million bushels over there. I think it was soybeans." And uh, he says, "At the market," and he hangs the phone up. And then the market drops right through that support like butter, and there's like a selling panic that beginning that begins to ensue. <laughs> and then the older guy says to the young guy, he says. And you were saying, so just keep in mind, it's a framework to work around. But like uh, like Douglas says, all it takes is one a-hole to screw up a perfectly good trade. So I'm pretty sure that was a Douglas story uh, to begin with. I'm, I'm pretty bad about not giving people credit, but I do try to, at the end, go back and um, and follow up. Okay, oh, it was, it was from Market Wizards. Okay, Jack says from Market Wizards from some big trader's office. Yeah, I think I've heard um, – I've heard Douglas retell that story, though, before. Um, it seems like a – you know, I wonder if it's just one of those Wall Street myths, but I'm sure I'm sure uh, it, it could have happened easily, okay? Um, it's a Douglas story, okay? Shay says it's Douglas. Somebody else says it's in, in Wizards. I think it actually did happen because um, it, it wouldn't surprise me. I mean, just, you know, knowing some of those people like that, that, that doesn't seem that far-fetched. Now – Anyway, I, my initial um, idea of covering energies was to talk about it's always darkest right before it gets more dark. And that's an ancient trend following more on proverb. Obviously, the original was it's always darkest right before it gets light. Okay, And there's some truth to that. But years ago I was in the markets and realized that hey a lot of times it's pretty dark and then it gets even more dark so that's why I came up with that it's always darkest right before it gets more dark and that's the thing about trend following is that you're not fighting the market you're following along you're gonna have a little lag you're not gonna get top dollar you're not gonna catch that bottom you're not gonna catch that top you're not gonna get out at the top you're not gonna get uh, out for shorts at the bottom but in between the top and the bottom, you could still make a lot of money, okay? So notice that in this particular case, it looked pretty ominous. I'm sorry. It looked pretty dark, okay? So it was at its darkest here for energies, and then it consolidated a little bit. Then what happens if we have a big gap lower? 
and it becomes even more dark. Now we do bottom out in here and begin to rally up. And then again, it looks kind of darkest right here. Once again, we're down here, tested these, which would now be a quadruple bottom. Now, what did we just say? By accident, kind of backed into this, okay? Look for your classical technical analysis like a triple top or a quadruple bottom or something, but don't trade off of that until you get a signal. So down here, it looks like it was its darkest, and then it became more dark. And then yesterday, energies continued to probe lower. OK, now they could be bottoming out. This could be that last little uh, panic sell off and that could be it. But that's not the way that I trade. Uh, sometimes in the markets, I'll see the 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 market just because just kind of exhausts itself to the downside. And I don't rush out and cover all my shorts when that happens. I'm not I'm not that good. There are some traders out there that claim to be that good. And, and I don't know. I mean, they probably tell you about it when they do it after the fact and when they don't they don't they don't probably tell you about the times where it sells off hard like that kind of like we're seeing the energies now where it becomes darkest and then it becomes even more dark after that okay so obviously uh this uh market's still headed in a downtrend here uh what else to kind of reiterate you don't necessarily want to sit around and wait for a death cross but something like the death cross and something like daylight and something like the order of the moving averages, meaning that the bow ties, if the 10 is less than 20 and less than the 30 is a general state, but you want to be on the what? Short side of the market, okay? And if those three are in uptrend proper order, you want to be in the long side of the market. And if they're in downtrend proper order, you want to be on the short side of the market. Now, that's a general statement. You also want to have some framework to work around or a setup and some other things too. But moving averages have the use, but all indicators have lag. The oscillator axiom. Yeah, you know, the, the um, I don't want to back too far into that, but be careful. I mean, since you brought it up, uh, be careful if, you, if you're using oscillators in that. Let's see if we can get a blank screen here. If you're using an oscillator, I would encourage you not to use what I call a bound oscillator. Let's say it goes from zero to 100, okay? Because what'll happen is it'll go up and it can't go any higher, so it'll do this. So it'll look like the ultimate top, and then it comes down to the bottom and it can't go any lower, okay? So that'll look like the ultimate bottom. If you're gonna use an oscillator, use something maybe that'll, that's not really bound. You might have some framework in there to look on, but it could just go higher and higher and then come down. But then by the time you do all this, why not just look at the price bar, Ed? Look at the um, look at the trend and see if there's any developing big picture patterns. By the way, it's kind of funny. Jake Bernstein said he was a uh, <laughs> he's uh, I met him down in Australia a few years back ago. He was on a and we were on a panel together. And on the panel, he was telling a story where he had a uh, let me see if I can make this happen somehow. It was funny. He had a, he had a chart up. And and the guy he was trying to train said um, said well it can't go it can't go any higher it can't go any higher than this so because that's the top of the chart so he just he you know he he here we go if I, let me see if I can make this happen I'm kind of digressing here but so what he did was he said oh it can't go higher the the, the guy he was trading says well it can't go higher than this because that's the top of the chart so then he's like so then he he did that for him, gave it a little room above the market so it can go higher. So anyway, I guess you had to be there. It was a little funnier while you were there. Anyway, so that's uh, the death cross going on. Uh, I was initially asked to uh, laugh out loud, put it at 11. Yeah, Jack. <laughs> it's kind of like the amplifier that goes to 11. You know, it's it's louder than the one that goes to 10. You know, <laughs> this one goes to 11. <laughs> well, this one goes to 11. You see, if my favorite amplifier goes to 11. <laughs> uh about three of you out there get that that's okay i have yet to watch that show in its entirety that movie in its entirety but i've seen uh, you got to watch it it's kind of like uh what's his name will ferrell movie you got to watch it in bits and pieces it's something you can't watch the whole thing michael gets it all right good <laughs> all right initially before i digress too far into all the energy stuff initially i was asked to talk about gold and silver so let's talk about those two things Just for S and G's, I threw in the um, the weekly death cross yet again. Um, 
and you can see it just kind of consolidated afterwards, but now it's breaking down or it has broken down again. This is gold. And uh, this is weekly gold, FYI, okay? And you could see, you know, once again, it, it, this is one of those, and I'm just kind of looking at it as we're talking, but I do remember when it broke down from that big base. This is one of those, it's always darkest right before it gets more dark. So as a trend follower, you want to err on the side of that longer term trend. So that's a weekly gold uh, chart there. Let's take a look at the silver. Now, this is a, a daily silver. And uh, just getting back to the weekly gold, I think the reason I wanted to show you the weekly was, if memory serves, was that we are getting a bit of a bottom on the daily. But the problem is you have a lot of overhead supply to deal with. So the longer term trend in gold is still headed lower. OK, but shorter term, we are getting a lot of stocks that are bottoming out. And as you can see on this weekly chart, so it's been up for one. Well, I guess week over week, but let's say one, two, about three weeks. It's headed mostly higher in here. But now you've got a lot of overhead supply to deal with. Now, on a daily silver chart, and I meant to put the goal in here too, but um, I'm, I don't know if I got it in or not. Uh, let's see. No, it's ended your stock. Okay. On a daily silver chart, you can see that it is trying to bottom out and rally up. We'll look at the live chart here in gold in just one second. But like the um, gold chart, or the weekly gold chart, I should say, you still have a lot of overhead resistance to overcome. Now, on an individual issue basis, this is kind of playing out. And what I wanted to show you, I recommended this stock, or I, sh I should say I put it on my landry list, which is, just, which is an ancillary list and not a quote-unquote official recommendation, but it's a, stocks, a list of stocks that have caught my attention that might be worth trading. And the reason this one caught my eye was kind of bottomed out here a little bit. Nothing to buy just yet. But then notice that it took off, okay, and then pulled back. Also, it made a bow tie. So this looked like a fantastic setup if I was just using the right side of the chart. By the way, if you find a broker that lets you trade off of the left side of the chart, please let me know. Now, the reason I didn't personally take this trade, although I put it out as a possible trade, but the reason I didn't personally take it, I just didn't like all this overhead supply. Now, remember, there's nothing magical about technical analysis, but anybody who buys during a range like that might be looking to get out at break even. Okay. Now, this was a tough decision for me because the setup was sort of like right at, if I could draw a fairly straight line here, it was kind of like right at that resistance. And if you draw it off the bottom of the resistance, it, it's a little bit better, a little bit more uh, indicative of what I'm trying to say here. So that's why I didn't take it. And I was thinking about it this morning. And I've said this time and time again. But any time you look at a chart and you're thinking about trading or just trading in general, you have to make decisions and, more importantly, live with them i often make a joke at my wife's expense she used to not mind it's funny now she she doesn't like it she's not gonna watch a show so i could uh i guess i could say it you know, marrying the most beautiful woman i ever met in my life was a pretty easy decision living with her is not no I, i'm kidding i love you babe uh but you get the idea once you actually make the decision you have to live with it. this particular case my decision was not to take the trade. Now, it's a little painful and aggravating to watch it go up, but I'm okay with that. I'm, I'm strangely okay with that, in, at least in more recent years. I used to really cuss and fuss and get mad because I missed an opportunity. But in this particular case, I made my decision, and I'm sticking to it. And right before the show, someone asked me, um, Dave, do you ever just exit a trade or raise your stop right after you get into it? Would you think that or or at some point in time would you think the trade no longer will work? And the answer to that is no. And the reason is that's that dead money report, not to beat the dead horse on that. Speaking of dead and dead horse and death cross and all that. But not to beat the dead horse on that. I don't because I'm picking the best stocks to, to begin with, okay? So like in this SA example, if it would have just been a little bit better and not uh, right at this overhead supply, I would have taken this stock because it's coming off of multi-year lows. It's a bow tie. It looks beautiful. Everything is there. 
and that's my opinion and I'm sticking with it and sticking to it okay and I'm gonna let the market prove me wrong my stop is gonna be placed outside of that normal volatility so in case it doesn't go exactly where I want it to go right away has some fits and starts I'll be able to maybe ride out those corrections and hopefully those corrections are just corrections and then takes off and then ride out the trend I've had quite a few stocks trigger over my career and just flat out die and I every day I question myself why am I still in this stupid stock well a longer term trend still looks pretty good I haven't gotten stopped out yet just kind of hang with it and see what happens and sometimes you get stopped out in those cases you're like damn I knew I should have exited okay but if you exit and it takes off then you can be like damn I wish I would have stayed with it so you can't you can't second guess yourself. You have to make that decision, and then you have to live with it. As I told somebody a while back, in for a penny, in for a pound. Once you're in a, once you're in a trade, stick with the trade, let it unfold, have your stop in place, and let the chips fall where they may. And remember, you only need to capture one or two good trends a year to make your entire year. Now, sometimes they could seem a little elusive, and sometimes you want to give up. Okay. But if you just keep chipping away at it, and in some cases, you, you don't do anything. You just sit back and either let your existing positions work or you wait, as we are now, and as I'm going to, once again, beat the dead horse again, you wait for conditions to improve, being that you wait for that market to get out of that trend. So, again, here's the case. Stock took off without me. I'm, I'm almost a little flippant about it, surprisingly flippant. And I feel like, hey, so what? Now, I want to talk a little bit. Of, last week, I began to talk about, like, a confirmed top with a bow tie. And it could be any other signal or someone else's signal or your own signal or a moving average crossing or whatever you want to use. I just like to work around the bow ties because it gives me a nice little structure. And having those exponential moving averages in there, they cross over a little bit more quickly than a, than a simple moving average, and it's mathematical, as I've said quite a bit, um, as Greg Mars taught me, and I just kind of noticed it empirically that they catch up the price faster, and he explained to me because it's, it's also mathematical. And years ago, I looked at them to, to do the calculations, and I did notice that uh, the, the last day price, it's like 90% of that price, depending on what moving average you're using, but it's a substantial amount of that calculation. It's just based on the last closing price. So if you get a chance, go in and look at how an exponential moving average is calculated. You never want to do that by hand, but go in and look at that, and that's going to make a lot more sense. And then the rest of that data is just uh, worked in. And I think that data actually goes on into infinity. So if you're looking at a 30-day moving average, it's it's highly weighted for that last day and those first 30 days. But after that, I think it goes on, if memory serves, into infinity. I'm not sure how that factors into the equation. But the main thing is that it is mostly focused on that last price bar. And that's why as soon as the price turns, for instance, let's say, uh, let me see if I could do this real quick. Let's say your price bar is here and you got a close here and you got a moving average here. As soon as that price closes below that moving average, that moving average will turn down. Now, in the long term ones, you have to really squint your eyes. You actually have to do the math to see it. OK. But it will turn down. Now, confirmed tops. Let's talk about this with confirmed tops. I'm digging a hole. What's that mean? <laughs> uh, last week we kind of talked about this. When you have a bow tie or a crossing over or any other signal, okay, with the exponential, okay, digging a hole, I hope I can get out of it. <laughs> yeah, I just study the exponential moving averages. You got to realize, uh, Michael, sometimes you say a moving average and somebody will say, what's that? Okay, <laughs> so not everybody knows how these things work. Uh, but here, let's say we're using the bow tie crossing over, 10 crossing over 20 and 20 crossing below 30, looking something like that, or actually just like this, okay? Notice that one's above the other, above the other, and then just the opposite down here. So that should change in signal. And then usually after your trends change signal, you get a little retrace, okay, or some kind of pullback. And that's how 
the setup actually works. But notice in this particular case, by the time you got your trend change signal, the market turned back up and it never did take out this low here, okay? So now we've got another trend change signal. This is the Rusty, by the way, the Russell 2000 IWM. And this is a daily chart, okay? So notice that we did get our bow tie here. So that means that the trend is changing. And notice that the low of the move and the bow tie occurred probably just after that low. So the low of the move is here. You got your retrace back up. So until this top gets taken out, this is what I call a confirmed top of the market. And then this is also, you can call this, it's kind of gatekeeper looking. It's also um, kind of first thrust looking. If memory serves, let's go back and look at that gold. That's probably why I had that weekly in there. I wanted to show you a weekly gatekeeper in the gold. Let's see if it's there. Yeah, right here, it's kind of a weekly gatekeeper. And that's when you make an all time high or a significant high you have a thrust down and the thrust backs up and it stalls short of that old high. Kind of looks like a reverse check mark. And what the, what kind of was cool with gold this morning is if you count the bars, usually the best ones occur right at about 10 or 11 bars. 10 is like ideal for some strange reason. I don't know why. I haven't really thought about that too much. But this is your top bar. So you start counting there. 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10. So it's like right at 10 bars in this little gatekeeper. So that's kind of a cool little deal. And notice that this was a retrace high. Okay. So until you take out that retrace high, this is your top, especially once you take out the low from the first move. Okay. Now let me just say that one more time. You get a thrust down. You get a retrace back up. So that retrace is your high, especially once it takes out that low. Okay. And until it gets above that retrace high, this top remains a confirmed top. Go back in history, take a look at bonds. The top in bonds was a beautiful gatekeeper type of top, followed by a bow tie right around the same time. Uh, this just occurs over and over and over in markets. It's not perfect. Don't get me wrong. It's, it's, it's not a holy grail. But if you just work around this structure, for the most part, you'll be on the right side of the market. So... We do have this confirmed top so far in the Russell 2000. It's not the end of the world, okay? Nor can you see it from here, but it is a bit of a concerning type of deal. And you also have some support back here in the Russell, so I wouldn't rush out and buy it just because of that. But it is kind of interesting that now we're right at support. And we are breaking below the 200-day moving average. Again, nothing magical about that. And you can see that the 50-day moving average is converging upon the 200 day moving average and it could make the death cross really soon. So that's not too pretty. It's a little uglier when you look at the two day rusty. Okay. So on a two day rusty, you can see that you have a bow tie. You didn't really get one back here on a two day chart. Okay. But now you have one and that one's off of all time highs. Now, just so you'll know, this moving average here, this is a 50-day moving average, but on a two-day chart, it would be times two. So this would be a 100-day moving average. And this is a 200-day moving average, so that'd be times two. So this is actually a 400-day moving average on a daily chart. So we're almost down. That's pretty interesting. You're almost down to the 400-day moving average. Uh, one thing I've noodled with before, and it's kind of fun to do, go back go back to the beginning of the Dow or Wherever, whatever data you have, as far back as you can go to the 50s or 60s of the S&P 500 or to the 1900s in the Dow, early 1900s, and put a 500-day bow tie, I'm sorry, 500-day moving average in there, or even like a 250-day moving average, but a 500 is pretty cool. And just start going click by click ahead on your chart and just watch that moving average. And it's kind of a fun thing to do. It's amazing how much of a move it'll catch. The moving average, if you're doing it live, it'll kind of look like this as your charts are going. Now, every now and then, that price will get way up here, and then it'll come crashing through it, okay? So you have to have some sort of money management plan in place, but it's kind of fun to do. And just simple little things like that, as long as the market is trending, will um, keep you on the right side of the market. Dave, do you teach all this in your stock course that you have on sale? Uh, I do. I do. I teach uh, the 
emerging trends. I teach the established trends. I teach picking the stocks, looking for uh, overheads, avoiding overhead supply, avoiding all those different things. And then I walk you through the database on how to pick them. And we do that over a series of weeks, too. And that's why it's uh, 14 hours uh, total. Where do you get that much data? Uh, you get it from Telechart. Most of my data comes from Telechart. Years ago, I had uh, – what was the Metastock program? Oh, I'm dating myself. They had one. Um, they had a market analyst uh, program on floppy disk, believe it or not, on these like five and a quarter inch floppies. Yeah, they had they had market uh, data for like the uh, indices going back forever. But uh, you can get uh, you can go back to the early 1900s and uh, and I'll show you that um, I'll show you the, the long term moving average and those things real quick. Let me just make a note. So before I digress too far, uh, no, it was uh, it was the 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 technician or something. Yeah, that's it, Michael. I forget what it's called. CompuServe. Yeah, I'm I'm almost that old. I went through a conference CompuServe um, um, TAD conference years ago. Um, What's his name? I forget oh, his name escapes me in a moment. He he uh he was our, our uh a few back few years back in New Orleans he was our guest lecturer. It was a very nice gentleman, super nice gentleman, pioneer in the business. Um, his name will come to me in just a second. Uh, anyway, so we got a two day bow tie. The reason I like to put these fifty day moving averages in here is because when you have the bow tie have a sharp angle of inflection on that fifty day moving average, sometimes it signals that the trend is changing and fairly fast. So bow tie is very much uh, concerning. Now I'm not going to bore you and read all this to you because we talked about it last week, but the waiting is the hardest part and it, it's still the hardest part. And that's tough for a lot of people in markets because in, in life, if you're a surgeon, you're paid to cut on people. And if you're not cutting on people, you're not making any money. If you're a lawyer, you have to do some lawyering, right? An accountant, do some accounting, you know. Um, <laughs> Might as well joke about the Pistons. Uh, but anyway, <laughs> you have to take some action. And sometimes trading, there's there's no action that needs to be taken. And if you get a chance, go in and read my um, article I wrote about the fat pitch. Uh, inspired by uh, this uh, Montier quote, which came from uh, Greg Morris's blog. But the main quote I've been looking for is uh, this one, and somebody was uh, nice enough to give it to me last week. I kept thinking of the word. I couldn't find the word groundwork, but it turns out it was foundation. And this is a, a gem from Livermore, one of the best from him. I, but I say that about all his uh, quotes. When you're doing nothing, no speculators who feel they must trade day in and day out are laying the foundation for your next venture. And as I said quite a bit, it, sometimes it could be more of a figurative sense in the market. If people are just back and forth, back and forth, back and forth, this becomes uh, a value zone, so to speak. And when this market begins to break out of that range, after it's a serious, serious range, it's a bit of a disequilibrium, okay? And then the market begins a trend, and that's the bigger the base, as I often preach, the further you could go into space. And by the way, with the gold stocks, I was asked about the reason they wanted me to cover them. They wanted to know if I was seeing any what I call the Phoenix setups. And Phoenix setup, all it is is you have, and gold's a great example of this now, you have like an area like gold that's just trended lower for years, and then they begin to bottom out and bottom out and bottom out. Well, so far, it's, it's more like this, okay? It's more like just a bow tie off. But when I talk about the Phoenix, it's more like a pattern that just goes sideways for a long, long time, kind of like building an aforementioned base. And then everybody gets used to these lower prices, and all of a sudden, when you begin to rally, you have that disequilibrium. So that's what I call the Phoenix. And a lot of times, these stocks, or even commodities, but mostly stocks, um, can reinvent themselves. The companies, I should say, can reinvent themselves and maybe the, the economy improves or whatever the case may be. And that's where these stocks can rise from the ashes. Uh, in commodities, it does happen to the stocks. Uh, the commodities obviously get sold out. And at some point, they do become a value uh, zone. Okay. 
Does Telechart offer any deals for your students? Uh, no, I don't think so. Uh, they're kind of like, they've been in between their affiliates program for a long time. So do use the link uh, under uh, getting started on my website under education, um, just in case their affiliate is still up and running. But um, no, they don't offer that uh, that deal. Okay. Uh, the other thing too, and I can't beat the dead horse enough on this, is that when conditions are or less than ideal, a la lately or like lately, you want to be super selective. So here's a soft sell. Uh, pick the best, leave the rest, and check out my stock selection course on my website. And just go to store or go to products from the home page and check it out. Like I said last week, if you go to that page on this landing page, uh, these were the actual stocks that I picked during the course, and there's a few more down here if you scroll down in the spreadsheet. So that was kind of cool to have that work out. Also, trade service, 99.99% uh, .99 of everything you see stock-wise in here, such as that aforementioned SA, comes straight from my trading for service. Uh, warts and all, sometimes I actually show a loser st losing stock in here, as some of you may know. Uh, but that most, uh, like I said, nearly everything, virtually everything comes straight from a trading service. So check that out. You get a chance, uh, go to my store or go to products on the homepage and click on trading service. There is a, a trial rates back at, at um, whatever, <laughs> have the trial rate back at. Okay, um, let's hop out to the charts and I'm going to go through the market real quick. So you guys start, uh, let me know, what, and girls, let me know what stocks you want me to cover. And I'll get to those as soon as we uh, go through the markets briefly. I like using a black screen when I'm not. Uh, so let me just get that up and running. Okay. All right, let's start by looking at the P's. And every now and then, just for fun, I, um, I will take the price out. Okay, uh, before we put any indicators or anything else in here, as you can see, we're just stuck in this range. You know, by the way, um, I did say I wanted to show you guys something here. Let's take a look at like the Dow. The Dow, the reason I use a Dow is because it goes back so far. So if you take the Dow 30 and you go like way back in time, okay, and then let's add like a, let's add a 500 day moving average to that and make it a really good color, like a nice orange or something. If you have time, it's kind of fun to play with these different things, especially like something like bow ties or whatever. But even a longer term moving average can be a lot of fun. Let's see if it's in there. Yep, it's in there. I just, I guess we haven't had 500 days yet. Let's see. So we're down to the, oh, here we go. There's your 500 day moving average. So it's kind of fun to go through these things and just kind of mess around a little bit. And you can see just like by the slope of the 500-day moving average or any 250, whatever moving average you want to use, uh, it, can, it can help to keep you on the right side of the market. But obviously, uh, when the market begins to implode, you have to have a stop in place. But you can see it's kind of fun to do these things. So let's see. It started in 1900, uh, 1919, 1920. So, again, you kind of get the idea. Um, check this out when you get a chance. I just mess around with it a little bit. It's it's just kind of fun. So you can see the the bear market of the 20s. Just notice that 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 was mostly contained by that that longer term moving average, and then the market begins to rally. Okay, we got a crash coming up in here somewhere, don't we? But you get the idea. Just kind of mess around with these different things, and and they're just a lot of fun to do. And maybe go a little bit shorter term too, with your bow ties or whatever, just to see how it all works out. That's the 500 in the Dow. That's kind of interesting. Let's get back to the P's. Take a look at short term. And uh, Michael, your uh, caps are on. Or are you yelling at? Are you yelling at me today? Or are your caps lock stuck? <laughs> There's your 500 day moving average way down here. Um, let's take a look at the bow ties. You can see we're traded below the 50 day moving average, and you can see we're down towards the bottom of the sh somewhat shorter term range, and we haven't really made much forward progress in a long, long time. Okay. Control B will step a line chart. Control B. Okay, I have to play with that later. 
I used to be a whiz with all these hotkeys, and then I, I started adding programs to my system that uh, interfered with my hotkeys. So there's your 200-day moving average. So as of today, if we close down here, or unless we have the mother of all great afternoons, right? We're going to close below the 200-day moving average. Nothing magical about that, but certainly not a good thing. And that's would put us down below this trading range. Um, here's what I'm kind of hoping happens, especially since I'm not that long anymore. I only have a couple longs left, a couple of half longs, okay? What I'm hoping happens is that today and maybe a little continuation from today, we have this one lash last shake out kind of like shake it of the tree before the market takes off so we come down here and it looks like the end of the world it would be great if we even got like a death cross to happen too you know and then the whole world thinks that the market is done and they have it going fly, go flying back up now keep in mind with this much overhead supply okay again anyone who bought during this range will be looking to get out of break even if we break below it now, if you break below it and you come right back up like that, then that's what I'm hoping for. I know, hoping one hand and blah, blah, blah. But that's what I'm hoping for. So, again, I'm hoping for this one last shakeout, so to speak, and then have the market go roaring back up through that, that overhead supply and take off. Okay? So that would be a good thing, obviously. But right now, it's beginning to break down. You want to honor your stops just in case. Don't sit around and wait for the death cross or whatever to happen. Uh, last week, we talked about this a little bit, too. And this might just be a squeeze. We get keep the socks coming. We're almost there. We're almost there. Okay. Um, but notice that on a weekly chart, the moving averages are coming together. The bow tie moving averages are coming together. And as I said earlier, when I was kind of beating a dead horse on um, – exponential moving averages notice that when the close is below the average the average does turn down okay any average even the 30 day here just with that one little crossing has turned down so as soon as price crosses it it will turn down so i learned about bow ties empirically by messing around with exponential moving averages with the simple mixed in but it's actually mathematical too that it will obviously change quicker and as soon as the price crosses through them. And you can see these longer term moving averages are going to be real slow to turn because they're also uh, simple. Okay. So we're right at this longer term. We're right at this. Uh, let's take a look at a daily chart. We're right below the 200 moving average. The 50 is kind of coming in. The other shorter term moving averages are all turned down. It's still not the end of the world. But you certainly want to honor your stops. You certainly don't want to rush out and buy a whole bunch of stocks here. Just make sure whatever you're buying is inefficient. Inefficient in that it's something like an IPO or um, a technology company, something or a commodity. But in this particular case, commodities aren't looking so hot. But some sort of area that you think could trade contra to the overall market. Okay. All right. That's the P's. Let's take a look at NASDAQ. And we'll just take a look at a few sectors here, and we'll hop right out to the to your questions. So keep them coming. Uh, NASDAQ, pretty ugly day here. Uh, down, what, about a percent and three quarters so far. Almost all the way down to its 200-day moving average. Now, this is what's cool about technical analysis. A lot of times, technicals come together right at the same point, okay? So where is it? it this, by the way, this is why you don't have to learn a tremendous amount of indicators, even though I'm not a, a big fan of indicators. But another reason why you don't need to learn a bunch of indicators is because a lot of your technicals are going to come together at the same point anyway. So just find a few to make them your favorite. And first and foremost, always look at your price chart. Now, with that said, price is down here towards the bottom of the range. What else is at the bottom of the range? Well, lo and behold, the 200 day moving average. Okay. So the 200 day moving average often acts as support, but you got to realize that a lot of times it's often at support too. So notice that it's kind of, kind of squeezed up right below the market and right below these lows in here, not a line in the sand, but an area to watch. Again, if we break below it and stay below it, either in both time and distance, okay, either in time or distance and ideally both, well, not ideally, but, if they we stay below it in both time and distance, then it's going to be really hard for this market to get back through this range. I don't want that to happen. What I want to happen is a little shakeout below, and then the market takes off 
goes out the top of the range, and then we have a nice trend for a long, long time. But I'm not afraid to short a market, okay? It's just not my favorite thing to do. Easy to read holler stuff is. This holler stuff is. Easier to read this holler stuff is. What does that mean, Michael? Easier to read this holler stuff is. Okay. Hoping for a fourth in Elliott terms. Well, use Elliott lightly. I'm not a big fan of Elliott Wave. And I don't want to uh, piss anybody off uh, by, by making some comments about that. But um, just tread lightly when it comes to uh, to Elliott Wave. Now, I've seen some amazing things done with Elliott, but only within trend, okay? And uh, Oh, I know that one guy called one top uh, about 30 years ago, and he's still famous because of that. But he's caught a lot of tops since, <laughs> daily and weekly. Um, predict early and often, I suppose. But if you do use something like Elliott, use it within trend. Everything works better with trend. And I noticed earlier, I kind of was thinking to myself, it's like, geez, I don't want to look like an Elliottician here because – I'm drawing like wave down one and then retrace and then wave down two or whatever it's called or three. Uh, but the market does unfold within that structure sometimes, but don't try to use it to protect, predict every zig and zag. And I think they even had patterns called zig and zags within Elliott. Uh, but use it with trend. And the bottom line is everything works better with trend anyway, so you might as well just trade trend, okay? So NASDAQ looking kind of ugly. Just look at a daily chart, and you can see it's just not too pretty, okay? Let's take a look at a couple of sectors in here, and then we'll hop out to the overall market. The rusty, we kind of beat the dead horse on that, but um, I'm not a huge fan of trend, of trend lines. Usually I just draw them through the bars, but in this particular case, it kind of works out nicely. Just connect the highs roughly, and you can see that that does not look very pretty. And that's a daily chart. We do have a lot of trading down here, so maybe it'll find a little support. But don't rush out and buy a market just because of some support in here. Energies yesterday, as you know, accelerated to new lows in here, looking kind of ominous. Uh, led mostly lower, I think, by steel and iron, industrial metals too, banging out new lows. One thing I've been noticing lately is there's some of these areas that tried to just take off in here, like the foods have come right back in. Some of these areas like biotech and drugs, which have been doing really well up at new highs, have come back in, and now they're sideways at best. Okay, so as you can see, I think I'm building a case for sitting on your hands and that all that waiting stuff still remains in place. Okay, um, I don't have a, a, an update, so this is a one-day-old chart, but I'm sure it's a little uglier if we had today's update in here. But you can see health services just made new highs. Now they're coming back in, so... They're kind of, yeah, longer term uptrend, sure, but shorter term to intermediate term, they're going kind of sideways in here. I can go on and on. I don't want to beat the dead horse too much. A couple of few areas, areas, a handful, maybe not even that many, at or near new highs, like the home builders. Maybe we'll see some setups there soon. Retail, for the most part, has been hanging in there, but now retail started to lose a little tiny bit of steam, too. So that's a little bit concerning there. What else is going on? I think uh, that's about it. A lot of areas. Like uh, like the semis, you can see remaining these pretty serious downtrends and actually beginning to accelerate lower in here. So that's a little bit of a concern. I always like to see the semis go in the same direction as the overall market. Okay. All right. Let's uh, let's go ahead and take a look. Unless there's some other sectors you want to cover, let's take a look at bonds real quick, and then we'll take a look at your uh, your setups. Now, bonds have an intermediate term bottom to them. They do have a nice little bow tie. It's off of one-year plus lows. It's not off of all-time lows or multi-year lows like back here, but it's still a bottom so far nonetheless. Now, the whole world had their panties in a wad over rising interest rates, rising interest rates, rising interest rates, rising interest rates, okay? And then they forgot about that, and it was Greece, 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 and then they forgot about that, and it was China, you know? So, well, for now, we don't have to worry about rising interest rates because interest rates are doing what? They're dropping, okay? So this is one small little glimmer of hope for this market. At least that's one thing you don't have to worry about. All right, let's uh, hop into the individual stocks. David is waiting patiently. He wants to know about WNDW, WNDW, WNDW. 
let's see I don't know that stock it doesn't sound familiar is that the right signal W N G W nope is there a is that the right signal six we'll come back to you on that one uh, Phil wants to know about BTU BTU well, I'm fat figuring everything today let's see BTU okay all right, doesn't take a rocket scientist to see which way this chart is headed. Now, somebody earlier, right before the show, asked me about the Phoenix strategy. Well, this could possibly be a Phoenix type of stock because this stock was up in the 70s a few years ago. Let's take a look at like a weekly chart. Okay, let's just go off the 2011 top at 70. And now it's at a buck and three quarters. Now, I wouldn't rush out and buy it today, okay, because obviously the longer-term trend is still in place. But do notice that your moving averages are coming together and look like they have the potential to cross over pretty soon. And also, as I often preach, look for first thrust first. So if this thing comes flying off the lows and pulls back a little bit, then, yeah, it might be worthwhile. But for now, I would not try to catch a falling knife. For now, the trend remains down, obviously. Solar Window Technologies, WNDW, OTC. I don't have it for some reason. Okay, tiny mid-cap. Okay, no, it's not. It's too small for my system, so I could pull it up in a different package, but I don't want to overload the CPU. Neat. This one's kind of interesting. Um, one thing I didn't like about this one was it kind of just kind of drifted higher in here, but it's okay. Okay, this was one I think that was on my, uh, let me see, control M. This was on my Landry list recently. I don't know, that's one of those hotkeys that doesn't work anymore. Let's see, control M, control, control M. Now see, sometimes it works and sometimes it doesn't. Oh, there it is. This one was recently on my Landry list, as you can see. Uh, 7th, 8th, 9th, 10th, 11th. Okay, so those are one day delayed. So what I was seeing is that you had like a knockout move here. So this was, that's the knockout move and it's okay, but biotech is a little questionable in here because biotech's lost a little steam. It's kind of going sideways. Like we looked at it just a few minutes ago. I think we looked at it. If not, let's just put the sub industry on there. Okay. And let me just clean this chart up. So you can see biotech in here. It looks like it could be in trouble. The the cyan line is biotech, or the blue line, whatever you want to call it, is headed lower. So that's something that's really not that great. And if you look back in time on this chart, you can see that, like I said earlier, like um, drugs overall, they've lost steam, at least on a net-net basis, way back in March. Where were they? Right around here. Where are they now? Right around here. Okay. So let's get rid of that and look at the chart again. Now, I've been showing people setups in my service as ancillary setups, meaning not official setups. If I had an official setup, which we had one for today, and one of you guys have already found it, so congratulations to you, Andre. I'm going to go ahead and take you off. Yes, Andre, I like that stock, uh, but it's on the service today, so I can't talk about it until it triggers, of course, um, which you may have. I haven't been watching it. But NEOT, okay, you can see it lost a little bit of, of momentum in here, but it still looked okay. Had a nice little knockout move. This is something that I might go after if conditions were a little better. But so far it has it triggered or triggered in a meaningful way. And now we got 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11. You got 12 days in this pullback, okay? So I would pass based on the number of days of the pullback and then dovetail that in with um, the fact that it is um, in biotech. Okay, why is this not a potential gatekeeper? Thanks. Well, uh, it's kind of a gatekeeper. The, the gatekeeper, you want to see more of a thrust lower than a pullback. Let's see if we could get a chart up or a blank uh, piece of screen. And that's the thing, too. Now, you got to realize that a deep, before I uh, dig myself in a hole here, keep in mind 
that a, a failed deep pullback or a failed first thrust – well, let me just stick with the pullback. A failed first thrust can become a gatekeeper. Let me rewind this whole thing. A failed pullback, a failed deep pullback can become a gatekeeper. Okay, so if you have a deep pullback and you're like, oh, this looks good, nice little correction here, if that fails – shy of the prior highs then it's possibly possible that it's a gatekeeper okay so again deep pullback which is bullish but if it stalls short of its old highs it becomes a gatekeeper that reverse check mark you see this pattern here so yeah let's take a look at that chart and see what it looks like so to some extent i hear what you're saying but keep in mind that this thing really didn't have that much of a deep pullback it was fairly deep but it wasn't like a super deep pullback so if it pulled back maybe a little bit further and then went rocketing up a little bit more like that i would call it a gatekeeper whereas in this particular case it sold off fairly hard but then it just kind of drifted back up in here it's not making that it's not doing this okay that big reverse check mark okay it's just kind of crawled up in here so I hear what you're saying. I mean, it's kind of in the spirit of the pattern, but it's not really the pattern. I wouldn't call it that. Now, with that said, it does start it is starting to look a little bit toppy in here. I mean, if you're long, stay long, but I would rush out and buy this market or this stock at this junction. In fact, take a look at where it is, 13, and let's go back in time, all the way back to July. Remember earlier I said it's kind of drifted higher in here. So now you've got how many days of sideways trading? You can go all the way back to about a month and change. So now you've got a month of trading where the stock hasn't made any forward progress, actually down three quarters of a percent. So we kind of beat that one up, but uh, yeah, I wouldn't take that one. Okay, you get it? Good. GDXJ, that's going to be the junior gold miners. Those can be kind of fun to trade. I'm not a huge fan of ETFs, but sometimes these uh, these juniors are kind of fun. Yeah, I mean, this looks good, and I bet you a dollar it's a bow tie or close to a bow tie, close enough uh, for government work. The only problem, like I've been saying with these golds and many of these golds, is you've got a lot of overhead supply to overcome. So this is where you're kind of like, well, let's just see if he can get past this overhead supply. And, yeah, you're giving up some of that early trend. Uh, but so I would I would not rush out and, and, and trade it now. What you could do for fun, I don't know if I could get the the um, components on this on the fly. Let's see components. Oh, let's see GDXJ is that in here somewhere? What's it called? Market vectors junior. Is it iShares? Market vectors. Market vectors. I don't think I could do. I don't think they have them all in here. But just for S and G's. Oh, here we go. Market vectors. You could come in here and take a look at the stocks that were, were in them. That's, here's the regular ones. I wonder where the GDXJ is. We'll just take a look at GDX if you want. It'd be more fun to look at the GDXJ. I don't know if they have them all, but let's just let me just show you for purposes. Let's see. Nope, they don't have them. Well, it'd be fun if they did. But, yeah, uh, just, just download them. Just go to uh, Market Vectors and, and get them, and then take a look at the individual issues. And if you could find some that don't have any overhead supply, then it might be worth a shot, okay? MOH on a pullback. Okay, let's take a look at it. Yeah, WNDW, for some reason I don't have it. Yeah, this one looks okay. It's a little wide and loose in its trend, but it looks okay. Um, now, it did break above. It didn't really break decisively above its little base, and now it's kind of pulling back to it. Um, again, it looks okay given the conditions of the overall market. I'm, I'm going for a lot more than just okay, okay? Um, a stock has to be, uh, to quote Michelle Wallace, pretty freaking far from just okay, to um, for me to get excited about it, okay. How many times have I said okay in that sentence? Okay, caps, C A P S. Are you making a joke? Because <laughs> I said you were screaming at me. 
All right, Mel wants to know about MNTA. Welcome to the show, Mel. Looks like a new person. Um, what if they a new person smell? Uh, it's a little sideways. Longer term, it's in a trend. If you're long, I would certainly stay long. But over the short term to intermediate term, you can see it's going mostly sideways. Let's put a, a horizontal line in here. It's around 22. Go back in time, 22. And you can see it hasn't made a whole lot of forward progress as of late. If you threw the longer term moving averages in there, maybe like a 200, I'm sure it's well above its 200, okay? But over the intermediate term here, it's mostly sideways. So I would, I would stay away from that one. What you could do is wait for a breakout and play the first pullback or let it break down and possibly um, short it. Andre, what's know about Aval, A-V-A-L. Uh... Why does my chart look funny? Oh, I got a bad tick. <laughs> had a bad tick on me the other day. We have tick issues this year for some strange reason. Uh, who asked me about this? This is the downtrend. Uh, so I would leave it alone. Maybe a fat finger to symbol. Okay. Was it A-V-O-O-L? All right, much better. All right, I was going to beat you up, Andre. That's not a... Uh, Andre's been around uh, me enough <laughs> in the markets enough. It's okay. The only thing I don't like is is the gap's a little bit extreme based on the volatility of the stock. I don't know what the volatility was before it gapped higher. It's it's almost a little too much of a gap. I like to see kind of a small gap like this in the direction of the trend. But it looks okay. I mean, you could certainly do much worse, but it, I'm going to give it an okay. Maybe it needs a little bit deeper pullback, but um, the, the gap's a little extreme on that one for my taste. And by the way, it's I, I meant to say this uh, caveat earlier. Keep in mind, with the market going mostly sideways like it is, you're probably thinking, I'm like, Mikey, I hate everything. Uh, that's not always the case. Sometimes you'll come to these shows and the market's trending, and it's like, geez, this guy's never met a setup he didn't like. Uh, but right now, we're not in that kind of market. MNTA, we talked about that one, Mel? I think we did. Yeah, we just covered that one. Kind of sideways lately. Uh, VIMC, let's take a look at that one. Okay, this one looks like it's in trouble. Now, remember, we just looked at semiconductors and where are semiconductors headed. In fact, we could, um, what if we just plot just the sub industry on this one? Let's see. Let's do a comparison symbol with uh, the sub industry. Plot sub industry comparison. There you go. Okay. So the cyan line is the semiconductors, and you can see they're pretty much headed lower. In this particular case, it's the specialized semiconductors. So it's going to be hard for me to rush out and buy a semiconductor right now. And then the other thing, and, and Mel, I know you're new to the show, so I'm not going to beat you up too bad. But the other thing is, on a net net basis, it's going mostly sideways. On a somewhat intermediate term basis, it's headed lower. Now, on the short side, I like to see stocks just bounce one or two days and then begin to implode, or a few days at most, ideally. I don't like to see them kind of just start meandering around and going sideways. But I would leave this alone uh, based on those things. It, it was a short maybe three weeks ago, but then it's got a gap against the trend on the short side. So it's, it's neither a short nor a long. All right, let's take a look at NDR. NDR, NDRM. NDR, oh, NDRM. All right, that looks good, uh, except for the fact that it's not set up just yet. But, yeah, this needs to be in your momentum list. Now, it is a biotechnology, which I'm not jumping up and down about today, although we do have a biotech or two in the portfolio. But it does have the makings or some interesting things that are happening. It's a relatively new issue. It has worked its way higher, and now it's beginning to accelerate higher. And usually what I call accelerating momentum strategy, let me just draw two lines. But This is like a, something I kind of occasionally was noodling with, call it third gear. But notice that it's worked its way higher, and then it's began to accelerate higher. But in this particular case, it's like first gear, second gear, and now it's in third gear, accelerating higher. So this needs to be on your momentum list if it isn't already. This should be on my Landry 100. If not, I will have to, I should put it in. 
let's see if it is not it's in my tradable universe ipos yeah i've got it a few lists but it's not in my landry 100 so if this thing starts making new highs i need to make sure i put it in my landry 100 unless i haven't updated the list lately anyway uh yeah on a pullback this looks fantastic uh i'm a little bit more lenient with ipos notice that it is breaking out to all-time highs on a little bit of acceleration so on a pullback absolutely keep that one on your watch list hopefully we'll talk about it in a couple of um, couple of months couple of years couple of weeks box short or are you talking about eri being a box short El Dorado. Um, I think I said we looked at this one last week. It's just it's kind of stair stepping its way higher, which is fine. Okay, that's kind of like a Darvis type of stock. And Ed, but what I prefer with stocks is I'd much rather see like a nice thrust higher and a pullback to get in on, kind of like back here. Although this pullback really wasn't deep enough for my taste. And then hopefully once I'm in, then it turns into a Darvis style box stock, one on top of the other. Uh, it looks okay. Uh, the problem is if it pulls back, it's going to pull back to this range. So in this particular case, give it a little room to breathe by hitting my uh, expansion key. I'd like to see something that looks like that. Maybe a run up to 11 and then a pull back and then look to trade it. Uh, good eye, though. That's good, good to keep on your watch list. VIMC, I think we did that one. Yeah, we did that one. Okay. Sino for Peter. C Y N O. Okay. Well, this is a stock that obviously looks like it's in trouble. Okay. So on a pullback, it might be worth shorting and you can see you've got your moving averages crossed over your moving averages turned down moving averages in downtrend proper order so it might be worth a short a uh, couple of caveats though one it's too thin for my taste to run out and short it okay and then also you do have quite a bit of supply i'm sorry uh, support you have a lot of support just below the market so I think it would pass based on those uh, couple of metrics there. AYI for Jerry. Good to see some uh, new faces here today. Yeah, this looks fantastic. This needs to be on your watch list, okay? Now, it is a semiconductor, so that would have me a little nervous. So in a case like this, if I see a good-looking stock like this, and it's a semiconductor, and I still like it, I'm going to go over to Yahoo Finance or Google Finance, and I'm going to see what they actually do. Maybe they're a semiconductor who makes semiconductors for a sector that is trending a little bit better. Or maybe they're some specialized company that's doing something that you really – they're yeah, they're using those little micro circuits or whatever or semiconductors, but they're not – they're not really a semiconductor like an Intel or something like that. They're actually making some kind of part or piece for, I don't know, let's say digital printers or something, something like that or, or whatever. So I would research them a little further. Uh, could use it. It's a little bit low on the HV side, but it's not, it's not incredibly horribly low or anything. Uh, obviously you can't go, you can't argue with the trend. The only thing would be a little concerning to me is that they might be priced for perfection. I mean, you're not getting in way back here. You're getting in after a three, four, five-year run, okay? Now, as a trend follower, I, I I always, I will never exit a trend as long as it's still trending. And, and technically, I should always be willing to go after a stock. But in a case like this, it might be a little bit mature, as some people say, mature in its trend. And it could be priced for perfection, meaning that, it's been in such a long uptrend for so long that it's caught enough people's eye or enough people have gone long to where everyone's looking for perfection. So let's say they come out with earnings and if the earnings don't knock the sock off, socks off of everyone, uh, even if they're a hundred percent or 200 percent or an incredible earnings, they might be expecting even more incredible earnings. So in a case like this, we could have a, a serious sell off and it could be the so-called price for perfection. 
Uh, I really can't argue with it too much, though, because it certainly is accelerating higher. I like a little bit, a little tiny more knockout move in here, but but certainly this is one of the better looking stocks we looked at uh, today. So whoever gave me that, uh, Jerry, uh, congratulations. Okay. AYI is a land builder for LED lights, really building supplies, not semi. Ah, thank you, Phil. Okay. So see, that's where that's where sometimes it gets a little muddy, gets a little tricky. Building materials, building supplies, construction, that's all doing pretty good right now. Let's like the home builders. I think I saw a DHI breakout. I think I put it in my minimalist a couple days ago. DHI. You know, there, there you go. There's a home builder, okay? So if they're building some LED lights to use in your house, your lamps, then um, then they're not – they're a semiconductor, but they're more like a, a, a building supply. Good point, Phil. Good job. Good job. Good job. Fantastic. All right, Andre wants to know about DBVT. DBVT. Okay. 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 Um, it kind of lost a little steam in here and did a knockout, but that, that knockout was okay looking. Let's go back a few days. And it was okay looking on that knockout move. Kind of a double top knockout looking type of deal. And I think I have this one in a couple of my lists. Let's just double check. Maybe I'm wrong. It's an IPO. Yeah, I've got in a few lists in here as a momentum list. Um, but now let's take a look at it. So it kind of had the knockout move, then it rallied up, and now it's kind of stalling out a, a little bit in here. So now you've got, I don't know if I can count that many that fast. You've got a month and a week. What's that, five weeks? you got five weeks of sideways action on a net-net basis. So it has begun to lose some steam. So I think I would pass based on that. If you're long, stay long. Keep a stop in place just in case, but uh, I wouldn't rush out and trade it. Keys. K-E-Y-S, okay. Well, you've got one big up day today, but that just might be an aberration. So let's take a look at the trend. Uh, so far, the trend has been headed lower, and then you've just got one big up day. Uh, on a big gap like this, I'm not that excited about a stock. If it were a smaller gap and then there's some structure, like a bow tie or a first thrust or something that followed, then I might be more excited. But this is just some sort of news event or something that's jerked this stock higher. Uh, I would not get excited about this stock. Believe it or not, this stock would probably, at this particular point in time with this big gap higher, it'd probably have to go to new highs and then pull back before I got excited about it. Okay. Okay, any more? In a quiet bunch today. We stop picking poor gear parameters to use in order to scan for stocks, uh, teach man to fish, et cetera. Um, yeah, the stock, the stock course, well, first of all, I, I probably give away too much. But first of all, I'll give you my exact scans, okay, first and foremost. But, yes, in the course, I teach you how to scan, uh, teach a man to fish. That's funny. You know, <laughs> what's, what's the old thing? Uh, Give a man a fish, he eats for a day. Teach a man a fish, he sits in a boat and drinks beer. He sits in a boat and drinks beer all day. Um, but no, I do teach you how to fish. And then here's the thing: with all my courses, the IPO course or the stock selection course or any other course that I will, past, present, or future, do um, or done, you have unlimited lifetime support. Now that doesn't mean, hey, Dave, uh, I want to build a trading system that has nothing to do with your trading system. You know, that's a different type of support, but. If you say, hey, Dave, based on your course, you say that this stock has acceleration and momentum and it's pulled back and it looks good. What do you think? Absolutely. Email me all you want on those things, but just be prepared to do some work. I'll just say, well, you know, you're missing a few parts here. This is why, kind of like I beat everybody up in the show a little bit sometimes. Uh, go back in and rewatch this segment or something like that. But, yeah, absolutely. I'll teach you how to fish uh, type of thing. A lot of times, especially like in my uh, – <laughs> My trading service, I work myself out of a job. But what I tell people is, hey, look, here's the deal. Once you do get it and once it clicks and once you're doing your own homework, just just kind of treat me as staff. Treat me like the institutions would. Like, oh, okay, this guy's pretty good. You know, we got our own guys, but let's let's keep him on staff uh, just in case 
you know, on a personal level, just in case you don't feel like doing your homework one day or you simply can't, or maybe, just maybe, I might be able to find something that you didn't see. Another pair of eyes out there, okay? But, yeah, I do a pretty bad job of working myself <laughs> out of a job. But thank you, Tony. I appreciate your interest on that. Thank you so much. Uh, excellent is a shard. Yeah, that's in a lot of trouble. Uh, this one came off my momentum list recently. Um, and this is the kind of market we're in. We talked about this one last week in the show. You back this chart out a few days, and it looked fantastic. Okay, you got a nice, nice accelerated move higher out of a big base breakout. This is a good looking stock. Okay, and I showed it in my Landry list. I wonder if it's still up there. Let's see. I showed it in my Landry list. Yeah, look right here: eight eleven, eight ten, and eleven. Okay, I showed it in my Landry list in the service because I loved it, but we didn't show. I didn't show it as official setup because I didn't like the action in biotech. I didn't like the action in the overall market. And again, this is where it comes to those make those decisions and live with them. Now, go in and watch last week's show. The beauty of this stock is that it continued to implode and it would not have triggered on that TKO anyway. So by simply waiting for an entry, very simple technique, okay? You got the TKO, you got to enter here, you got to put a stop down here somewhere. Just by waiting for that entry, you would have avoided a really awful looking trade. Now, will you short it now? It could set up as a short soon. The only problem is, and you have to be careful, not that I won't short a biotech, and I think I said this last week, but it is a biotech, and anything that's high tech or could have some sort of uh, G-Wild, G-Wiz factor to it, okay, they could – what if they come out? What if Ebola makes a comeback? Okay, and then they come out with a cure for Ebola. You know, it's like all of a sudden this stock is going to just go skyrocketing higher. So that's one thing I hate when I'm, I'm shorting these inefficient stocks. It can get a little dangerous. Okay, not that I will not. Not that I won't. Not that I won't. Is that double negative? Not that I will never short a biotech or a high tech stock. But it's just not my favorite stocks to short. Now, with that said, you do have a lot of support right here. So I'd like to see it take out a little bit more of this support and then on a pullback. Yeah, it's possible on that one. Okay. But, yeah, good eye, Nate. Richard wants to know about Facebook. Um, it looks okay from a momentum standpoint. But if you zoom the chart out, you've got – Let's take a look at the pullback. It's been pulling back for a month, literally a month, okay? So that's too many days in a pullback. So I would pass based on that. It looks like it's lost some momentum in here. You can see the bow tie moving average is beginning to roll over. Looks like it's coming down to its 50. It does have a lot of support down around 85 below the market, but I wouldn't buy it just because of that. So I think I'd pass on, on the Facebook. I'm going to unlike that one. How's that? Okay, any more? What's your ideal pullback period? Um, it depends, okay? Uh, probably my favorite pullback pattern would be a combination of three of my patterns. Would be the accelerating momentum strategy, Persistent pullbacks, and on top of that, a TKO, okay? So, like in the Exxon, we don't have quite we don't have quite all three of those, but we do have some persistency. Persistency means that it tends to go up day after day after day. So, a persistent pullback is going to look, um, if you drew a line through the bars, persistent pullbacks are going to look like this. So, a pullback period... I like the TKOs when they happen like in one day because you have that one big bam move and then the stock, it shakes everybody out and the stock takes off so fast, people don't have time to sit around and contemplate the navel and decide whether or not they want to go long the stock, okay? Um, now, if it becomes just like a generic pullback, I would say uh, eight, nine days would probably be the maximum on that because now... Once you get past nine days, now you're two weeks where that particular stock or that particular market hasn't made a new high. So you have to, at that point, begin to wonder uh, if it has begun to lose some momentum. So in a case like that, you need to think about whether or not it's worth still going after. 
So maximum, and, and it depends. Now, sometimes you'll get uh, like an IPO or something, and they'll just kind of drift lower, and I might go into maybe 10 days if it's had a nice thrust higher, just kind of drifting lower. And keep in mind that IPOs can have a breakout characteristic to them too. So you can be a little bit more lenient because you're not only playing that pullback in that particular case, case but you're also playing a bit of a breakout. Now, with that said, seven, eight days as a general rule, nine days, somewhere in that range is too many days for a pullback. And what's my ideal range? Uh, several days, let's say three, would probably be ideal. And then in an ideal world, you get the trend knockout move, which is that one-day move. And like I said, everything I – like I've said time and time again – Everything I do has a psychological backing to it. So with the TKO, you're knocking out the weak hands. You're attracting the eager shorts. And if it just implodes one day and closes poorly, it's like everybody rushes to the door to sell. And then that selling, it becomes like a vacuum and it just exhausts itself. And when that stock takes out the high for the day, it then begins to accelerate higher. The, hurt, the shorts are hurt, pups, pup. The longs that got long, knocked out have to either buy back or – just stand on the side, sign lines and let it go. And sometimes it'll, they'll be forced to chase it higher. So the predicament of all these aforementioned people kind of comes together to push it higher. Apple, that's the longest we've ever had a show without talking about Apple. Uh, at the beginning of the show, I used to do, um, you know, Wheel of Fortune, they do R, S, T, L, and E. People couldn't solve puzzles because they're stupid. So they started they started giving them away all the, the normal letters. I mean, pretty soon they're just going to, like, give them all the letters and it'll be up there and like, okay, read this, read the puzzle and you get your prize. <laughs> so I used to put in R, S, T, L, and E, and uh, Apple was one of them, Apple, Google, and some other ones everybody always want to know about. Uh, triple top and Apple. Uh, you know, I, I wrote in my column three weeks ago, stick a fork in Apple. Okay, it's done. And, you know, someone was saying a while back, oh, I'm, I'm putting out a buy on Apple. And I'm like, why? And they're like, well, because every time it goes down, it comes back. Well, that'll work until it don't, okay? And, yeah, Apple has come back nicely quite a bit throughout the years, but at some point it won't. Now, Apple's a big, efficient company, so I'm not excited about rushing out and, and trading it one way or the other. And it does, like I said, it does tend to bounce back quite a bit. So I'm not really crazy about trading Apple, but it does look like it's in a lot of trouble in here. And let's take a look at like a two-day chart. Let's see if we could kind of drill out. There's a three-day, four-day. So you can see you almost have a four-day weekly bow tie. So I think Apple's in a lot of trouble. Uh, it's not set up per se today, but it's certainly in trouble, and it might be shortable along, along its way uh, lower. But, yeah, go and look at my um, – if you look on my website, you can look at the column archives, and you can see I've talked a lot about Apple. Okay. All right. We got like one more minute. Any uh, any final questions, comments, complaints, interesting anecdotes, jokes? As usual, great show, Dave. Thank you, Nate. I appreciate. It. Thanks for showing up. I appreciate you uh, coming by again this week. Dave, if you were long a stock, would you add to it if TKO et cetera occurred? Um, yes and no. Okay, it depends on where I am in the money management cycle. So let's take a look at that real quick. And hopefully I can zoom it in within the last before our time is up here. Um, if I'm long a stock. OK, let's just say we've got he's he used the TKO example. Brilliant. OK, let's say I get long here and I got to stop here. If it rallies up and I hit my initial profit target, okay, so let's use round numbers. Let's say 200 shares. Keep it small and easy, okay? Then I would sell 100 shares up here, okay? Now, let's say somewhere subsequently to this, we had a nice little TKO move. Then by all means, I would put back on 100 shares, okay? Now, uh, chances of, of it setting up again before it hit the profit target are pretty slim, because what would have to happen is, let's say you've got the pullback, okay, a TKO, whatever, and you trade that. Well, if in order for it to have another TKO, it would have to get significantly higher, which would likely be to the initial profit target. If it just TKO'd like that 
without getting significantly higher, I would probably be stopped out. And let's say I wasn't stopped out, I would just stick with the position. This would not be a new signal, okay? And even if it did look like a great signal, which I doubt it could because of what I just said, I would not take it unless I've already flipped out some shares. And I call this swing trading around the core position. Now, I probably should figure out a way to incorporate it into my trading service, but I think it would probably be a nightmare. You know, at one point my wife told me you can't do everything for them because I'm like, well, I'm trying to do this and people, some people don't get this. She says, well, you can't always do everything for everyone. So that's why I don't incorporate the adding back in, but we would probably do a lot better in some of these longer term trends if we did uh, as a general statement in the overall service do that. Personally, I will do that. When I say we, I'm talking about the collective and the service. But yeah, by all means, it's called swing trading around a core position. And just real quick, and we're going to have to shut it down here, I know, but uh, real quick. Swing trading around a core position would be thrust, pull back, thrust, pull back, thrust, pull back, thrust. So you would put them on here. Let's say you put on 200 here and you flip out maybe 100 here and then it pulls back. You put on another 100 here. So you just rinse and repeat. So what happens is you get these little swing trades within your longer term trend. You have a core position that works, which is, I guess, to be 100 shares. So you always have 100 shares on this particular case. But in some cases, you'd be flipping out on and off, flipping on and off another 100 shares. Okay, hopefully that made sense. I'm not kind of rushed it. Okay, uh, we got to wrap things up. I, I I appreciate you guys coming. You have no idea um, how much I do that. I do. Um, I'm honored by your presence. I love doing these shows, and as you can tell, and I'm so glad you guys uh, showed up, and girls. I appreciate it so much. Uh, any unanswered questions, Dave at DaveLandry.com. And if we don't talk to you now in the weekend, everybody have a fantastic weekend. And I'll see you guys again um, on Monday. Science is a fun teach. Apply to trading in the market. You're a miracle. Hey, thank you so much, Brian. Appreciate that. Ciao. Buongiorno from Marco. Well, buongiorno. You ever notice when they say buongiorno, they go buongiorno. It just kind of dies out. <laughs> All right. Thanks again, everyone. Uh, have a fantastic weekend if we don't talk again. And uh, see you guys and girls hopefully next week. Thank you so much.